Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath hours, for the time that we have to study your word, and we're thankful for the blessings of this past week and the trials and difficulties that you have foreseen and that you have prepared for us and are preparing us by them. We just ask, Lord, that um, you can continue to work upon our hearts, on the hearts of those who are seeking your face and seeking to have a Christ-like character by understanding your truth. We ask, Lord, for your presence here as we open your word together. Guide and direct us in all that we do, and may your angels attend us as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, happy Sabbath, everyone, and um, welcome you to the study, the Friday night study. And as you can see here, we're going to continue our study on uh, 666, but some things have arisen this week, and some of you may be familiar with them because you were there, uh, but an understanding regarding the 1335 in our relationship to the study in Josiah or not Josiah, uh, Joshua, the book of Joshua. So, so there's a number of things that we have to look at. And um, so I'm going to be trying to pull some of these things together. To do so, I'm going to have to just do a little bit of a review. Um, and then we'll see how this unfolds as we go through this study. Obviously, anybody who has any input or insight or questions or observations, feel free to participate. Um, I like the morning studies when Dwight's presenting, because then, you know, I don't feel like I'm just talking by myself. I can uh, talk with Dwight, and so hopefully, you know, people can uh, participate in this study. Now, um, so a very brief summary, what we've been looking at, which was initiated by uh, Colin's study, dealing with Revelation 17, the riddle of Revelation 17, that he then applied uh, to Daniel chapter 11, verses 1, 2, and 3, and also to Daniel chapter 3, the, the golden image. So he tied these all together and took the Sunday law from Daniel chapter 3, that this represents these kingdoms, but this kingdom here is going to be the United States at the Sunday law, because we know that already. And he looked at Daniel 11, and he looked at the kings, the presidents of the United States, the kings of Persia, and, and we related those together um, to, the, to the presidents from the time of the end up until the Sunday law. And based upon our understanding that Trump was going to be um, the sixth head, the sixth king, and that, um, now we never initially uh, did it all in that way. We were looking at Daniel. We weren't looking at seven kings per se. So we were just looking at Trump as the last president of the United States. But then when Biden came in, we could see that we had a count of seven. And then the idea from the riddle is that Trump would be the one that would come back and be the eighth. So in that study, we just began looking at what he was presenting, going back over the pioneers and, and our past understanding of things. And we came across the pioneers view of the heads, that is the heads of the beasts of Revelation 12, 13, and 17. As we looked at these more closely, we saw that the pioneers did not place the heads as the kingdoms that they placed the heads as the forms of Roman government. And when it came to the riddle in Revelation 17, and we're, we're gonna continue to look at this, but this is just, so I'm not gonna go there right now and look at it in detail, but we will as we go through this study over the following weeks. Um, but we know the riddle. You know, five are fallen, one is, and one is yet to come. And when he continues, he must continue a short space. And then there's going to be this eighth head. 
then he's going to be of the seven. And so the idea that we have always had is that these are the kingdoms, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, and Papal, and then the United States being the sixth head, the one that is, and then the seventh being the UN, and then the eighth being the papacy. That's the way that we've understood this. So in applying this riddle in the way that we did to the kings, the argument that Colin is using is that uh, the eighth head has to be one of the kings because we would take the eighth head as the papacy, that's one of the, the heads, and so it just is resurrected. But when it comes to the kings of the United States, to the presidents, then he would say, well, it has to be one of those presidents, which I disagreed with him. I didn't think that that was a great interpretation of the text. That is, I didn't think that that's what was implied, that you have to have that president rise again, that, that there would be a connection. So I'm not discounting what Colin's teaching, because I think there's something there that we need to see. But in examining this, we went back to the pioneers and, you know, it was interpreted by some that we've sort of, were, I was attacking the whole idea of our understanding of Revelation 17, which I don't disagree with. That is, I think there's a truth to our understanding of Revelation 17, that is, it's an application. And that we just didn't realize it was an application and that the pioneer's view is also correct. So we have it in an application as part of a repeat of history that we would need to understand and we would need to understand more thoroughly. So I know these are a lot of um, balls in the air, things that we have to keep track of, but most of them we should, we should be very familiar with. The problem comes when we start to look at the pioneer's understanding is that um, we think of it as an either or situation. And of course, we still need to understand the pioneers' views. That is, there wasn't a, um, a consistent view, let's say, regarding Revelation 13. Um, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go back and we're going to read. This is kind of interesting. So I have this on the screen right now. This is uh, from May 15th, 1840. So uh, March 20th, 1840 is when the signs of the times began as a periodical uh, that Joshua V. Himes was funding, and he's the editor. And, and this is a fairly introductory uh, article regarding William Miller. So it, it, it gives things in quite a succinct manner regarding what he was teaching. So, you know, it says Miller, Mr. Miller is about 60 years of age, gives some of his background. And then he's going to talk about some of his views. And uh, the first view that he's going to talk about here is, he says, in a very ingenious manner, he brings all the mystic numbers in scripture prophecy to bear upon the important epoch of 1843. First, he makes the 2300 days or years of Daniel um, 8, verse 14, to commence at the same time should be as the 70 weeks or the 490 years, which latter period terminated in the cutting off of the Messiah, AD 33. So he believed that Jesus was crucified in 33 AD, as we know, on the 12th day of the first month. Uh, the former period that extends 1810 years longer or until 1843, when the end shall come. And he says, second, the mystic number of the beast, 666, Revelation 13, 18, he applies to pagan Rome. It indicates 666 years, commencing with the league between the Romans and the Jews, BC 158, and terminates when the pagan sacrifice ceased at Rome, AD 508. Third, this period, AD 508, he thinks is referred to by Daniel in chapter 12, verse 11, as the time when the daily sacrifice or heathen rites shall be taken away or cease at Rome. From this, he reckons 1290 years uh, for the duration of the abomination that maketh desolate or the papal civil power, which terminated in the captivity of the Pope in 1798. Fourth, the 1335 years, Daniel 12, 12, includes the last mention, mentioned period of 1290 and passing 45 years beyond brings us to 1843. 
before the end. And then 50 brings the prophecy or denunciation of Moses, Leviticus 26, 23, 24, to refer to this period seven times or 25, 20 years, right? So what are the three periods? What are the main three periods that we know that um, Ellen White says Miller was given the, the commencement of the chain of truth? And what are the three dates that he was given as commencement periods? Six seventy seven. Yeah, six seventy seven is one. So that's the the main commencement. But Miller says he was given three three, three commencements. So we have six seventy seven, uh, four fifty seven, mm -hmm. and five oh eight. Right. So so five oh eight is going to begin the thirteen thirty five, right. 457 begin the 2300 days and 677 the 2520 and in um great controversy page what i can't remember the page number now was it 391 or is it three i can't remember the page anyway the one where it talks about uh the portion right that the 70 weeks and the 2300 days are, are a portion of the same great prophetic period Right in there, she said she lists these things that um, uh, the judgment was at hand. The oh, here I'm going to have to go there. This, this this is actually an important point. So um, I have to go to here. Early writings. Great controversy. There's a number of great prophetic periods, but um, well, actually, this is interesting. So I'm going to go here, even though this isn't the one I was going to go to first. Um, she says, when therefore he found in his study of the Bible various chronological periods that according to his understanding of them extended to the second coming of Christ, he could not but regard them as the times before appointed, which God had revealed unto his servants. The secret things, says Moses, belong unto our Lord, the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and out to our children forever. And the Lord declares by the prophet Amos that he will do nothing but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. The student of God's word may then confidently expect to find the most stupendous event to take place in human history, clearly pointed out in the scriptures of truth. Now she's going to quote um, Bliss's book, which is the autobiography of William Miller. She's going to quote page 75 from that book. And uh, Part of, part of a passage, which is actually a couple of chapters, a couple of pass, uh, paragraphs, but she's just giving part of this. Uh, so Miller says, as I was fully convinced that all scripture given by inspiration of God is profitable, that it came not at any time by the will of man, but was written as holy men were moved by the Holy Ghost and was written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. I could but regard the chronological portions of the Bible as being as much a portion of the word of God and as much entitled to our serious consideration as any other portion of the scriptures. I therefore felt that in endeavoring to comprehend what God had in his mercy seemed fit to reveal to us, I had no right to pass over the prophetic periods. Um, so when we think about this, uh, yeah. Um, now, if you go back here, she's actually going to quote from page 74 as well. Another kind of evidence that vitally affected my mind, he says, was the chronology of the scriptures. 
I found that predicted events which had been fulfilled in the past often incurred within a given time. The 120 years of the flood, the seven days that were to precede it, with 40 days of predicted rain, the 400 years of the sojourn of Abraham's seed, the three days of the butler and baker's dreams, the seven years of Pharaoh's, the 40 years in the wilderness, the three and a half years of famine, the 70 years captivity, Nebuchadnezzar seven times, and the seven weeks, three score and two weeks, and the one week making 70 weeks determined upon the Jews. The events limited by these times were all once only a matter of prophecy and were fulfilled in accordance with the predictions. So Miller lists off a number of prophecies. Now you'll see some ellipses here. Um, does anybody know what's left out of this quote? No, I don't. Okay, so we're going to go there. So I'm going to have to go over to Miller's works. Uh, there's Bliss. Memoirs of Miller, William Miller is what it's called. And it's going to be on page 74. So go back here a bit. So it's kind of interesting, um, this whole section. Um, so another kind of evidence that vitally affected my mind. So Ellen White's gonna quote this basically word for word, but she's gonna leave one of these things out. And that is Isaiah um, 7 verse 8, the 65 years to the breaking of Ephraim. Now, why do you think Ellen White leaves that out? Why wouldn't she have included the 65 years to the breaking of Ephraim from Isaiah 75, 7 verse 8? Did she leave it out or did one of the editors leave it out since this would be a very clear reference to the periods that we would call the 2520? Okay, I believe she left it out because I don't believe that this is uh, correct. Okay. Because is it 65 years to the breaking of Ephraim? Is Ephraim broken in 65 years from 742 BC? If you, if you take all of Israel as Ephraim, then could we not say that yes, it was? Yeah, but it's not all of Israel because Judah um, because if you read the passage uh, in Isaiah chapter 7, first is the prophecy is not given to the northern kingdom. It's given to Ahaz, who's the king of Judah. And what he's saying is what's going to happen to Israel is going to happen to you. The prophecy is Israel being forsaken of both their kings. So when he says here, um, and the, the key is this word within. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is re reason. And within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. Now, the word within, so I, I don't believe that this is a correct translation of this passage, first off. So the word within is a word that means an iteration. So what's an iteration? It's a repetition. It's a type of repetition, right? E? So what's going to happen to Ephraim is going to happen to Judah in 65 years. That's what's being said. And you're going to see that later in chapter 7 when it talks about uh, this child that's going to be born, which is Manasseh. And it talks about that the land that thou abhors shall be forsaken of both her kings. So, so to translate this in this way, it seems like Ephraim is going to be broken within 65 years, but that's not what actually is being said. And so I believe that Ellen White leaves this out 
because it's incorrect. That, that's, that's my opinion anyway. Now, some people would say maybe editors left it out, but uh, Ellen White was involved in the making of the Great Controversy. I mean, you have the 1888 Great Controversy leaves it out as well as the 1911. So both of them leave out this passage. Now, this wasn't the main point here though. So that's just kind of an aside. 65 for Judah, Iran says, yeah. Uh, but it's just the way the King James talks about it. It seems like 65 years for Ephraim, but it's basically saying it's going to happen to Judah in 65 years. What's going to happen to Ephraim, which is going to happen right soon, is going to happen to Judah in 65 years. That, that's the idea of, of the verse. Okay, so when therefore I found... The 2300 prophetic days, which were to mark the length of the vision from the Persian to the end of the fourth kingdom, the seven times continuance of the dispersion of God's people, and the 1335 prophetic days to the standing of Daniel in his lot, all extending evidently to the advent with our other with other prophetical periods, I but could but regard them as the times before appointed. So we can see here we have the 2300 days, 457, uh, the seven times, 677, and the 1335, which begins in 508. When we look at Ellen White's statement in The Great Controversy, so I don't know how to go back to that. Um, yeah, here, that went back easily. So. So she is not going to quote him. She's going to uh, talk here in the third person. When therefore he found in his study of the Bible various chronological periods that according to his understanding of them extended to the second coming of Christ. So what are those various chronological periods that he found that extended to the second coming of Christ? He just told us what they were, right? The 2300 days, the 2520, and the 1335. Now, was he correct that they extended to the second coming of Christ? No. But is she implying that he was correct regarding these various chronological periods? Yes. Yeah. And and people who say that she doesn't mention the 2520, she's here quoting a passage, or at least paraphrasing it, where you can see that the various chronological periods that she's referring to have to be the three that he refers to in that passage. That they can't be some other periods, because these are the three, the various chronological periods, definitely can't be just the 2300 days. It has to be all three of these. And then, and then he, she's going to quote um, the, the next paragraph, too, where he talks about this as well. Um, I had no right to pass over the prophetic periods. So, so we know that Ellen White is here obliquely referencing the 2520 in, in a hidden way. But it's clear once you understand the history that she's talking about the 2520. Now, um, so we're gonna go back to my bookmarks. I have to go here. So looking back here where we talk about um, Miller's understanding, the second, the mystic number, the 666, and the 1335 that are being talked about here. When we look at the 1335, do we normally think of it as attached to the 666 years in Adventism? Not at all. No. So we talk about 508 as Seventh-day Adventists. At, as historic Seventh-day Adventists who believe in the time prophecies, 
But the start of that period of 1335 being five <laughs> The start of that period being 508 is connected to the 666 years that begin in 158 BC. So, so to, to me, this is an important point because what is this about? If we read on the context here, this period AD 508, he thinks is referred to by Daniel 1211 as the time when the daily or heathen right shall be taken away or cease at Rome. So this is the taking away of the daily. But part of that is that it's connected to the 666 years. And, and we've done some study on this. So we've looked at the fact that there are three explicit periods of 666 years. One that begins in 158 and ends in 508, which would be an inclusive count or an ordinal count. 508 would be the 666th year. And, it, and it's interesting that the date that we have now marked in 508 is what date? What event in 508 do we now mark as ending that period of 666 years? December 25th when Clovis was baptized. So Clovis being baptized in, in, in 508 rather than in 496, I think is the date that they normally have. So he's baptized on December 25th, 508. And we have December 25th in our line as a symbol of the Sunday law. We also know it's the 25th day of the 12th month that uh, Jehoiachin is released from prison by evil Merodach. And so there's all of these different connections or symbols um, that we now can understand more clearly. Now, if we're going to look at December 25th, 508, is it connected to 666? Being a symbol of the Sunday law is one, but is December 25th just itself connected to the mark of the beast? Considering what I know about Satanism, definitely. Satanists yeah. sacrifice boy babies and pretend they're Jesus Christ on December 25th. Okay. Well. Yeah, so we have this 600, we, we know December 25th is a symbol that's a pagan symbol. And that the 666 years is dealing with this transition from papal Rome to, uh, from pagan Rome to papal Rome. Now we saw that the 666 years that began in 597 BC with the captivity of Jehoiachin, who's released on December 25th, well, the 25th day of the 12th month, it's actually in March, but the symbol, 36 years after he's taken captive. Can we see the comparison here? Because we know 36 is a shorthand for 666. And so we can't say it's a coincidence that Clovis is baptized Christmas Day on 508, and that, um, Jehoiachin, who begins his captivity, begins a period of 666 years that ends in 70 AD, um, 36 years after the close of probation for the Jews. But we, we can't say it's a coincidence that he's released on the 25th day of the 12th month, correct? It's, it's not a coincidence. Anybody agree with me that it's not a coincidence? Nothing is a coincidence. <laughs> okay. Well, there are coincidences, but nothing is a coincidence in God's word. Because we see already that it's something that, that's well established. So this 666 what? years of Jehoiachin. <laughs> so the 666 years of Jehoiachin, of his captivity. I mean, he's captive for 36 years. But if we count Ezekiel's count, the 666 year is 70 AD. And that's, so that's gonna tie Leviticus 26, which is Jehoiachin's captivity in siege of Jerusalem, to the siege of Jerusalem from Deuteronomy 28, which occurs in 70 AD, the 666 years. 
And we also have from 129 BC, from Judean independence, we have um, attached to that 666 years that ends in 538. So all of these periods of 666 years are relevant. But we can see that the period that Miller has is attached to 1335 years. Now, this is where we're going to go to the study that was done on Sunday. So on, on March 6th, uh, we had this study. And here it is here. So I'm going to have to try to uh, bring everybody up to date on this who did not see it. Now, remember, 158... Peter, excuse me, Theodore. I was going to ask you, what day uh, in March was it? In March, in is it the 16th or the 12th? or What date what? Oh, I just wanted to know what day in March that Jehoiachin was, was released from prison. Okay. Um, well, that's a good question. So I'll just quickly look it up. So it was in... 561 BC and it was well it would have been March 25th on uh, the Gregorian calendar and March 31st on the Julian so it would be March Thank 25th. you. Okay. Okay, so um I'm just going to bring up this diagram. So this is the diagram that Stephen uh, prepared, but behind me on, on the whiteboard is the original uh, diagram that we did on Sunday. And what we were looking at is that there's this league made with the Gibeonites in 1493 BC. So this is uh, Joshua. Uh, he had made this league with the Gibeonites. They're going to be the ones who are going to then have to, to be servants as, you know, um, hewers of wood and drawers of water. And, and they become sort of connected with the idea of the Nephinim as well. But they're going to make this league with the Gibeonites. And it's, it's going to cause all kinds of problems. One is uh, there's going to be five kings from the south that are going to come. Uh, they have a confederacy and come against uh, the Israelites because of this league. Well, actually, they go against the Gibeonites and the Israelites because of their agreement with uh, the Gibeonites, they have to come to their defense. And this is going to be three days after they make this league that they're going to realize that they were deceived. And when I was looking at this, I was thinking, well, these three days remind me of three years. And of the League with the Gibeonites reminds me of the Jews League with Rome. And we know that there is a three year period that's marked from 161 BC to 158 BC. And uh, we're going to look into that in more detail later on, not, not maybe today, but maybe in one of our other studies. I, I kind of wanted to get this all put together and then we can look at some of the details. Now, we've looked at it before. So the idea is that Miller chooses 158 BC, but he understands about the events in 161 BC, but he looks at when the league, the agreement goes into effect. And we can see that with the Israelites league with the Gibeonites, we're going to mark when they realize that they have to, that they've been deceived and they're now going to have to come to the rescue of the Gibeonites, who are their neighbors. And there was a bunch of symbolism in there, the moldy bread and the wineskins, all these types of things, which uh, we're not going to go into right now, but you can watch those studies if you haven't seen them. Now, the question that I had was, well, I wonder how many years back it is from 158 BC to this league. So how many years is it between the two leagues? And it's going to be 1335 years. So Stephen had prepared this before, that is, he had seen this period of time, but he hadn't connected it with the league, that is, 
He wasn't looking at what was happening with the Gibeonites in 1493. He was just looking at is that's the year that they crossed the Jordan. But we can see here that if we're going to take anything that's going to connect us with 158 BC, it would have to be the league that was made with the Gibeonites. That would be the parallel. Now, he puts the league with the Jews here in 161, but it goes into effect three years later when uh, events bring that about. So that it's sort of, in a sense, renewed. And that's the date that Miller chooses, 158 BC. And we can see the 666 years. Hopefully you can see that from 158 BC to 508. Um, Stephen puts an asterisk there and says it's inclusive reckoning or an ordinal count. And he also has this period of two, 2001 years. Now, this comes from Miller's writings, this idea of the two, uh, 2001 years from 158 BC to 1843. So that wasn't something that Stephen noticed, except that you can see from 1843 to 2001, when the second angel arrives, that's 158 years. So there's lots of things that this study brings about. But the main thing here is to see this 666. Now, when we go to 161, how many years is it from 1493 BC to 161 BC on this chart? It looks like you subtract three years. Yeah, so it's 1332, right? 32, yeah. And 1332 is simply 666 times two. So, so we have, again, not just um, the 1335, we also have this 666 times two, this 1332, which also shows up from 508 to 1840. And then the three years from 1840 to 1843 to finish or complete the 1335 years. So, so this was understood by Stephen way back, um, because I remember this. And it's something that I've noted because I've run into the 1332 before as well um, in other places, which uh, deal with our time. But, but here we can see that there's this 666 years of Miller. And this movement hasn't really acknowledged it. That is, we, we, we do acknowledge it, but we've always had a problem with it. And there was always a problem in Millerite history. That is, not everyone accepted Miller's 666 years. And I would say that about our movement, that there's this, it's not something we prominently present. Now, one of the things is, we often think of things um, that can be mutually exclusive, and there are things that are mutually exclusive. But can we say that the 666 years applying to the papacy, to the Pope's title, Vicarious Filei Dei, is connected to what we see here? Can we, can we see that? Yeah, I can see it. Right, because this comes all the way from Babylon, right? Yeah. That's from just that's from Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 28. It's not on here right now, but the 666 years that tie the siege of Jerusalem by Babylon and the siege of Jerusalem by Rome with the two 36 year periods at either side of it, the one for the period of Jehoiachin's personal captivity which typifies the 666 and the 36 years on the other end from the close of probation for the Jews until the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So from 34 AD to 70 AD. So we can see that, that the 666 years is taking this symbol that comes from Babylonian mysticism and it's passing it to pagan Rome. And then pagan Rome is going to pass it on to papal Rome, correct? Right. Yeah. Yep. So, so we can see that, but we also have the fact that it's passed on to this mark of the beast. So that's the one thing that we we don't clearly see here. That is, we don't see 
the United States, you know, until we get to 2001, the second angel arriving, so 9-11. So can we say that this 158 years from 1843 and the 161 years from 1840, August 11th, 1840 to September 11th, 2001, and from this blessing, blessed is he who waiteth and cometh to the the end of the 1335, this 158 years, all ending in the year 2001, and the 1493 years from 508, because remember, we're starting at 1493 BC. Can we see that this is pointing to the United States? And that the Sunday law is connected with this arrival of the second angel. So what are, what are we missing here in this diagram? The, two, the connection of the 2001 between 161 BC and 1840. Okay, so from 161 BC to 1840, what is that connection? Well, 161, we have Judas Maccabeus sending two emissaries to Rome yeah. to execute a treaty of friendship. Okay. Right? Yeah. In 1840, we have emissaries from the Islamic power of Turkey sending emissaries to the powers of Europe for protection. Okay. So really good point. So we can see that there was a league in 1840, right? Right. Is there a league in 2001? There would have to be. Okay, now we know one league quite well, and that's the league between the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the Protestant churches regarding spiritual formation. Correct? Right, correct. Okay. Is that all we have? Is that, is that sufficient? Is that, because we're dealing with ancient Israel in the past, and, and so should this league be regarding the church? I think that fits the best, but I think there's more to it. Yeah, I, I would agree. So there's probably more to it. I, I can't bring it all into my mind here. But I mean, we, we can see that this is the Israelites making the league with the Gibeonites. It's going to be 2001 years before 508, which is at the end of 666 years, the, marking this league with the Jews or the Romans. I mean, the Jews making a league with the Romans. And we can see that that's going to bring us to 2001 in, with all these different periods. And we have, um, we have this, this league theme tying us through. We can see the league in 1840 with Islam. So that's going to tie Islam is making a league, but Islam is not the church in this case. Right, so we can see the other one in a sense is the church, the Jews, the Israelites. Um, and then we're gonna have the powers of Europe and this league that Islam is going to have, but that's gonna be 161 years to 2001 when Islam will attack the United States. But isn't in, in this situation, mm -hmm. isn't Islam the protector of the true church. 
Yes. So, so they are. So, okay, but the 161, as you're just pointing out, yeah. Islam is attacking the impure church or the, the army of the impure church in 2001. Yes. But there's still something I think missing, but, but I see what you're saying. But, but we know that there's also this other league that's happening in 2001, September of 2001, um, where we have this spiritual formation officially being adopted by the church, um, that, which is the Protestants putting a pressure on Adventism in order to be accredited university. For our ministers to be recognized, they have to bow down to idols. So, so that that's an important point. It, it, Dwight, your mic's off. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So, we have a league in 1493 BC. Yeah. We have a league in 161. Yeah. We have a ratification of that league in 158. Yeah. We have a league in 1840. Yeah. We have a league in 2001. Yeah. Is there a league in 1843? Well, what ends up happening in 1843 is the Protestants are going to reject with the first disappointment um miller's message so uh, whether that marks a league or not that millerites then join with the protestants in opposing god's people that could could be considered a type of league but it's not as clear to me there now another thing that we noted which is relevant here is that we can see that 158 is a symbol of the 15th day of the eighth month, August 15th, 1844. And uh, 161 is a symbol of the 16th day of the first month. So another point that was brought out had to do with our personal line regarding uh, December 25th. So we are, what I've been saying here in some of the morning studies is that the Sunday law arrived in 2001 on September 11th. That is, in the morning studies, we have seen that our line, our history is a zoom in to the way mark of the Sunday law that Ellen White saw on her line. And we are always looking for the Sunday law as something future, but we have actually been in this Sunday law since 9-11. Now, of course, we're zoomed in, so there's more detail, and we're passing through that history of the Sunday Law. But what we noticed is that Dwight had done a presentation on, um, well, 161 days before December 25th, 2021. And this was dealing with, so the other symbol that we have is the 20th day of the ninth month, the 20th day of the ninth month in Ezra chapter 10 is this call after a period of three days that they're going to confess their marriage to the strange wives and this 20th day of the ninth month when dwight is presenting this he's presenting it as going from july 18th because this was on July 17th, he does the presentation. So July 18th is going to be 160 days to December 25th, 2021. But he was counting, um, you're counting the 160 days, I believe, as a Correct. Son. Right. But, but I noted that he was presenting this 161 days before July, uh, or before December 25th, 2021. And the significance of the 161 is it's, we have the 525 and the 252 that divide the 777 days. We also showed that 
we could divide it in 433 or 434 and 343 days. And, and this was also another division of the 161 and 616. So we can see that we can divide the 777 days in these three different ways that are iterations of the same numbers, but just in different order. And so the significance there is that we can see that this 161 years is related to the 161 days. And, and this was about December 25th, 2021. So in our line, we can see that we have some of these elements and um, we're gonna look at this in more detail of how all of this fits together in our lines, um, the 666 days and, and things like that um, in future studies. But for now, just the idea that we can take this 161 days and we can see that it's connected to this symbol here of the Sunday law, which is 9-11. But we know we have still a Sunday law that's coming in the future. But all of these things are typifying this or pointing to this. Um, okay, so Angela's making a note that she hadn't found anything in regarding 2001 that fits, looking for three years before the 2001. Okay. Okay, so, so. I still think there's more that we're going to find as we continue through this study. Yeah, I, I think so too. Like the only thing that I found that might fit is the uh, Mid, Mid Eastern Pact because there the US was involved with Israel and Palestine. There's, there's, there's gotta be more. Yeah, well, well, yeah. but I, I do think that when we look at what happened with the church, that would be to me the primary marker for 2001, when it comes to a league, if we're going to keep this, this is a line of the leagues and, and their relationship. Now, um, there's, there's something else here too, which, um, hey, William, you have a comment? just his mic went on okay so um yeah if, if, if we go back to 161 for a moment yeah we have an acceptance of a league in 161 between judas maccabeus and the roman senate right yeah is that also not a rejection of those that had been in power over the Jews in 161. Um, in other words, they are rejecting Greece to accept Rome. Okay. They're yeah. rejecting the Seleucid Empire. Yeah, because there's this progression in which they, they become free from Greece's control, the, the control of Greece. Um, basically, by 129 BC, um they have complete independence from from greece okay but in 1840 yeah we have the beginning of a progression of a church rejecting the power of the other methods of biblical study hi guys hi mark okay hi, being hello mark hi, can you let dwight finish first Yes, uh, but I will let you speak. I say so sorry, Mrs. Denny. Could you have uh, me to catch up? Oh. Very teeny, please. Okay. I will hear. Okay, Mark. I'm not being very rude again. Okay. Hey, Dwight. Okay, but you you just mentioned this progression. Mm -hmm from 161 to 158. Yeah. Isn't 1840 to 1843 a progression in well as well? Because by 1843, there became a unity of those that would study line upon line 
against those that would that would seek to take the understanding of other men. Yeah. Yeah. Which which is uh, I think. I mean, because what what we know is that this eighteen forty three really marks April eighteenth, eighteen forty four. Okay, so you know, the, sunset on April eighteenth. Okay, so the the situation that we're looking at here from fourteen ninety three to five oh eight. Yeah, we're seeing this as being a progression from theocracy and the ruling of Israel by other men. Then we have the 1493 being repeated again from 508 to 2001. Yeah. And is this not an acceptance by the corporate church of the opinions of others, including those within the Catholic faith that churches must accept spiritual formation in order to continue to grow as they see it in Christ. Yes, I mean, because what you're seeing there is paganism. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's pagan worship. So there's no, no other way to put that. Yeah, because and we know the papacy is just uh, paganism in papal garb or Christian garb. I mean, so um, it's dressed up to look Christian, and and that's really what you see with spiritual formation. I mean, it's it's dressed up with mixed with Adventism, but it's just pure idolatry um, and spiritualism. So, so we'd have to see that two thousand and one becomes relevant here. With the arrival of the second angel that's going to empower the third angel that arrived on october 22nd 1844. so ellen white is looking for this sunday law and we sort of have been looking for the sunday law still as future but my argument is that we need to see that as far as what ellen white is seeing in the future 9 11 is marking the beginning of that sunday law that's going to progress so, which I, which I think is an important point here is that we're seeing all of this connection to the past. Now, the, the illustration that keeps showing up in our studies has to do with the acceptance of uh, Protestant, pagan, papal ideas that become mixed into the movement that we need to recognize that Miller's rules are the sanctified means by which God is leading his people. And that this is expounded upon with our under, with an increased light upon line upon line, what it means and how we are to study. And that many people are not studying correctly. That is, they're not following Miller's rules. They're not aware of the fact that they're not following Miller's rules. But one of the things about Miller's rules is that we need to go back to the past and understand God's leading in our past history. That would be part of our understanding. That's actually the basis of this movement. And so we can see now as we go back to the 666 years of Miller that it's giving light for our feet today. Uh, hopefully we can see that. That it's not something that we we should be embarrassed about you know that miller got either the wrong event to start the league with uh the Ro with rome the jewish league with rome or that he's gonna miss out on the fact that there's no zero year and count that as 666 years because if he's going to start in 158 um and end on december 25th 508 that's definitely much closer to 666 years than if you had started at the beginning of 5, 159 BC, you know, one year earlier. 
that would be closer to 667 years. So you can see that this is a period of 666 years. Okay, so Chris asks a question. He says, um, in Joshua 9, 6, is not the league made with the Hivites actually a covenant league in the sense of cutting, uh, like a compact, compact made between passing between, um, compact because made by passing between pieces of flesh and the answer to that would be yes so what's the point there chris why are you asking that what's what is it that you're noticing well it's just interesting because we have been talking uh, so much about covenant and when you start using the word league then the mind sometimes doesn't draw the same correlation okay okay yeah so so it is a covenant Right, that's that is a covenant. A league is a type of covenant, um, and and we know that the the covenant being made or the league that's made. Uh, um, Chris, Chris, um, I asking you right now. Uh, what you did say and what that is means. I want to know how a covenant is made. Between two groups uh, of people. Me, uh, I, my aide said to me, do not know what is mean. A long word is means. I don't know what is, what means a long word. For oh, the covenant, okay. Yeah, and yeah. other one, Chris just said, other two, two, Chris just said, and not understand him what he just said. Okay, so can you explain yourself more clearly, Chris? Well, I was just pointing out that um, we've been studying a league, which is, a, or not a league, but a covenant, which is between two people or two groups of people. And we're now talking about this league between the Hivites and the Israelites, and then also in uh, 158 between the Romans, I believe, and the Hebrews. Yeah. And uh, we're calling it a league. And I was just wanting to clarify that this league or synonym for league could also be covenant right. uh, if it was the same, basically the same. Yeah. Now, when, when we get the idea of a covenant, I mean, Abraham makes a covenant with God, or God makes a covenant with Abraham. When he has Abraham cut the animals in half, and God passes, and Abraham, they pass between these carcasses, these dead animals, as a symbol of what would happen to you if you break that covenant. So, and that's the idea of cutting a covenant. Also, we have the idea of the seven times. That is to swear or to make a covenant or an oath. It you you do it as if it's repeated seven times, and so we can see that the twenty five twenty is the curse of the covenant for breaking the covenant, and that it also occurs in a chiastic structure by cutting the animals in half. And and we can see that this is a chiastic structure that we have here. It's it's. It's a rather involved chiastic structure. It doesn't got just a straight center and so forth. Um, now, um, so when we look at these, these covenants that are made, there's the original covenant that God makes to man, and God keeps renewing that covenant in various ways. But man, in making covenants with others, He's actually rejecting this covenant. And we could see that, you know, the league that Israelites make with the Gibeonites, or with the Hivites, that in 2001, the Seventh-day Adventist Church makes a covenant with the Protestants without consulting God. And this is going to relate to this movement as well. So we're going to see that 
that this history that we're looking at here, this is past history, all of it, is speaking to our history at the present time. So some of these th themes are coming up. The symbol of three days. So we know that there's a call, three days, to go to Jerusalem to make confession and, and repentance regarding the marriage to the strange wives, which is going to be addressed um, from the first day of the 10th month and be completed on the first day of the first month. That is, the 10th, 11th, and 12th months are going to be completed when those divorces to these foreign wives is going to be completed. So is that significant that we have this first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month? That is, Ezra chapter 7 is going to start with the first day of the first month. And that whole line of Ezra is going to end on the first day of the first month in the following year. Is that significant? Because we're dealing with 1843. Is the first day of the first month important connected to this 1335? Seems like it would be, yes. Yeah, so, so we would have to recognize that this 1,335 years is going to end at the start of the first day of the first month. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be attached to that symbol. But we also know that that's applying to our history as well, so that we can take these various histories, these different 666-year periods, these different co covenants and, league, and leagues, however we're going to describe them, and we can see that on December 25th, 2021, we have this call to go to Jerusalem three days before. That three days, we're going to say, is the 777 days, because there are three days marked, November 9th, July 18th, and December 25th. We've already marked those as those three Sabbaths as part of that 777 days. And so we were call, called to repentance on December 25th, 2021, to separate from the strange wives. But we have a period of time to do that. We do it from the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month. And we have never really addressed when this is and how those symbols apply. We will, because I believe I know how they apply. But there's some study that foundation that we're going to have to get in place first before we go into that study thoroughly. So the goal or the aim is the first day of the first month in which that will be completed. Okay. Um, any other loose ends that I'm, anything that people notice here? Okay, so just a question, maybe it's a sort of like a test. What is it that we have determined in our study that we need to do in order to answer that call of December 25th, 2021, of the 20th day of the ninth month, the call of Ezra to come to Jerusalem to divorce from our strange wives? How are we characterizing that? What's our main point? I know Dwight could explain it quite well because he's done studies on it. But can somebody articulate what that point is, what this movement is coming to understand, what we're coming to understand through the morning studies and, and Dwight studies?
it would seem to me that uh, you're, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm not getting to the point you're talking about, but um, it would seem to me you're talking or could be talking about um, God uh, extends a covenant to all those who will uh, be part of his kingdom, and he's expecting us to take up that covenant and to do what the covenant uh, is involved, you know, the involvement of the covenant with us. Right. So, so when we look at the covenant, the, a renewal of the covenant, right? Uh, uh, excuse me, please. Yeah. Uh, I am asking, what is, what is his name? Whose name? Uh, he did spoke. Chris? No, other one. I don't know. Uh, um, I did say I not know. I not say I not know what it. I I not follow what it means he did say. Okay. Well. So what we're saying is that we need to go into covenant with God. So we need to renew the covenant that God made with Abraham primarily because that's how this is all tied together. Now, in, in with Abraham, what were the chapters that we looked at that, that the covenant was given? Genesis 15 and 17. I know we're two of them. Okay, so we have chapter 12, right? And 15 and 17. That's going to be the circumcision. And then we're going to have chapter 22, correct? Right. Offering of Isaac. And we got this number 667,320. And Stephen noted, I believe it was him, that if we divide this by 360, that it equals 187 years in prophetic time. So we can see that the symbol of the covenant is this number 187. That is, the 187th day of the Jewish year is the Day of Atonement. And this covenant has to do with this prom promises made through the religious ceremonies. And when we come to the Day of Atonement, that person's destiny is being decided. So God is calling us through the understanding of July 18, 2020, to understand that he wants to renew this covenant with his people. Would, would we agree with that? I'd say so, yeah. Yeah. Most certain. Yeah. Now, I had also noticed something about this number. So this 67320, I know that there's this number 67920. And 67920 is the number of days in 2300 lunar months. That is, if I take this number and divide it by two, 2300, I get this number. 29530. Uh, it's 04 instead of 0587 and 0434, but it's very, very close, definitely within the day. Uh, it's only like a, an hour or so off um, from being 2300 months. So 2300 months equals 67,920 days. Now, the interesting thing about this number, if we go to this six seven nine two zero whoops i typed it in wrong six seven nine two zero days so 2300 months and i make the same application that is i take off this 187 years so this is this is also 186 years by the way so the number of cardinal days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. So if you count, 
from the first day of the first month, and you count the next day as one all the way through. So it depends how you count. But if I take this number and I subtract the 67320, you'll see I have 187 years. Now, how many months is 600 days in prophetic time? If I divide it by 30, I'll get 20 months. So this symbol of 2300 lunar months is equal to 187 years and 20 months, which is a symbol of 18720. So there's more to this, which I'm not really ready to share, but we can see here clearly that um, the covenant that God wants to renew with us has to do with the symbols that have been provided by a study of July 18, 2020. That is, without all of this study on chronology, we would have no idea that God wants to renew this covenant with us. And we have no idea of how he would do that, even if we thought he might want to do that. That is, how do people typically look at this covenant? If they're looking at a covenant with God, what symbol do they usually apply? And it's not incorrect, but it's, it's what we usually think of. If we go into covenant with God, because I was watching uh, Apology and Defense number seven uh, from September 14th, 2019, because Dwight had given us to us as homework. And if anybody's watched that, what was Jeff referring to as going into covenant? With God, what what symbol do we use? So, in other words, only one person did the homework. Wow. <laughs> well, maybe they just didn't pick up on it. Don't be hard on them, Dwight. Um, and that's what happened to me. I listened to it and watched it, but I didn't pick up on that piece of it. Okay, what about baptism? Exactly. Right. So he was talking about Clayton's baptism. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Or conversion? Or are you talking about baptism particularly? The baptism. He was talking about the baptism and that that's going into covenant with God and that you need to be converted when you're baptized. You need to have your your Christian life in in a row. You don't just baptize as if something magical is going to happen and you're going to be changed because you got baptized. Yeah, baptism is a symbol, basically, or a sign of your conversion, right? Yeah. So if we look at 2001, 9-11, do we mark baptism at 9-11? We should be able to. Okay. Yeah. So so we do. We mark that as 9-11, as the first day of the first month, right? We mark it with baptism. We have lots of different symbols that we use for it, but 9-11 is a symbol of baptism. So, so we can see that God has been calling us to go into covenant with him since 9-11, at least, because we have the symbol of baptism there. And, and this movement is the children of 9-11, right? So, so we know that there's a connection there uh, with what God is trying to do with this movement in understanding this covenant. And God has been progressing us through these events, through our experience, through... Um, all of the things that he has unfolded to this movement. And yet many of us are not aware of what God is wanting to do. It is often we are going to make these leagues or covenants with the world, with Protestantism, instead of recognizing that God has called us out of the world to be a peculiar people.
So there's a lot more that we need to study on this, but hopefully this ties together some of these things that we have been studying. And we ne need to recognize, so some of the things, you know, Ralph Meyer study on the 666, dealing with the Pope's names adding to 666 in 1798. I think is still significant. I think Collins' study is significant. I think Odilio's study, dealing with Nero, and his study dealing with COVID-19, is significant. All of these things God is giving to us, and he's asking us to examine them and put them together to get a complete picture. If we take one of them by themselves, we're not going to have a complete picture. If we reject Millerite understanding, we're not going to have a complete picture. The understanding of Revelation 13. So I'll finish off here. So I'm going to share again this quote from Bates, which I've shown before. So Joseph Bates. Um, I just learned how to bookmark things. It's so fun. I don't have to go zooming through everything. Um, so here, uh, Joseph Bates, he starts here. Are we not perfectly safe in regarding the two-horned beast as the symbol of a civil and religious power differing in some respects from the old one preceding it? So the one that precedes it is the beast from the sea. This is the beast from the land. Will not our better judgment decide at once that the location of this power is in America and the civil power of one horn is the government of the Republic and the religious power of the other horn, Protestantism, and that Republicanism and Protestantism united will make itself an image to the seven headed beast and thus become united. Thus the text in chapter uh, 1711 is explained as follows. So he's gonna to go to chapter 17. The beast that was denotes the Roman Republic that was 1900 years ago and is not. That is, it was not when John was having his vision in 96 because Imperial Rome was then the form of government and continued to be until 538 when the seventh form of government came, that is Papal Rome. So he's gonna mark the seventh head as the papal form of government, where we mark, uh, we mark these differently because we use the kingdoms, but he's going to use the seven forms of Roman government. So the five that are fallen are all the that occurred prior to the imperial form. And in 96, it's still imperial Rome. They have emperors. And then it's going to follow with the seventh, which continues a short space. And we know that this short space is does it mean that it's short, that it's a few days or something like that? It has to do with the fact that it's cut off of a larger period. So 1260 years is a short space, prophetically. So then it says, um, when the seventh form of government, that is Papal Rome, even he is the eighth. So Papal Rome. And then it says, even he is the eighth. The eighth, undoubtedly, is, as we have shown, the two-horned beast with its image, a symbol of the people of Republican America, as they are and will be, and is of the seven, meaning it's one of the forms of Roman government, though he's going to take it a little bit differently. He says, the eighth will cause all under his influence to worship the one that is called the seventh. He will also make an image to him and require all under penalty of death to worship it. Although the seat of the seven-headed beast is separate from the two-horned, one-headed beast, by the broad Atlantic, yet so determined is that old serpent called the devil and Satan to have this one head united with the seven, that he is moving his agents with all power signs and lying wonders to affect his object even unto death, Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees. And goeth into perdition. The angel had so declared in verse 8. But where is perdition? 
at the Supper of the Great God just before the coming of Christ. The seventh and the eighth are both slain together. So the seventh is, according to Bates, the papacy. The eighth, the false prophet. Correct? Revelation 19, 19 to 20, 19 and 20. A thousand years from that, at the judgment of the great day, they, with the devil that deceived them, are cast into the lake of fire and brimstone and burned up root and branch, chapter 2010. Gone to perdition. This is the final end of all the wicked. Mark, this is in perfect harmony with the third angel's solemn warning. Here, then, is the clear family likeness between the harlot mother and her daughters. The mother begins under Republican Rome. The daughters unite with the mother in making war with the lamb under Republican America. The lamb destroys the whole family and leaves them in perdition. Spare thy people, Lord. So Joseph Bates, July 22, 1851. So I am of the, the view that Bates is primarily correct. There's obviously things that he can't see that we can now see. But that doesn't mean that we're going to abandon the understanding of the five are fallen, one is, and one is yet to come in the application that we've made. That is, we're going to take both of these views and say that they are telling us something, but our view is addressing a repeat of history. That is, we came to our view of the understanding in a repeat of history, and that we can't ignore that, just like we can't ignore the presidents of the United States or the 666 of the names of the, 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 uh, the, pap the popes, or what happens with on July 18th um, in 54 AD, I think it is, when Rome is burned by Nero. All of these different things come to play. We need to fit them together in the framework that God has given through prophecy and recognize that these things are, some of them are types, some of them are, um, being repeated in our history. And in fact, all history is being repeated in our time. And that we can take these different applications and see that they all are telling us more and more detail. That is, if we think about a fractal, the idea that we can zoom into our Sunday law way mark that Ellen White sees, and then we can see all of this detail, we know that all of that detail is also a repeat of history. That is, every waymark typifies every other waymark. Do we agree with that idea? Yeah. 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 This is one of the things that Parminder didn't want us to believe. He rejected the idea that a waymark can typify another waymark. Well, that was actually a complete rejection of our message. Once he said that, I recognized that, but I, I wasn't. I just thought he didn't know what he was doing or what he was saying, but he did. He understood quite clearly what he was doing and what he was saying. And we can't do the same thing. We can't make that mistake. But if we're going to look back at these past histories, we're going to have to follow the example that has been given this movement from the beginning. And so it's not an either or with the 666. We don't have to say, well, does it just represent, uh, you know, vicarious filae dei, or does it actually represent as well the 666 years? And I think we can see quite clearly that the 666 years is placed on solid ground. Now, in the Apology and Defense, Jeff talks about this, about those that build their house on the rock and those that build their house on the sand. And, and the reason why Dwight brought that apology and defense for us to watch is that we can see that there is um, a, the Parminder and Tess, they were following CNN. So they were following 
What power? What power are they following? That'd be the dragon power, right? And then we can see that some are following Fox. They're following the, the false prophet. So both of those streams are false. And we have to recognize that just because we see Parminder and Tess going one direction doesn't mean that we go the other direction. Doesn't mean we reject CNN and accept Fox because both streams are corrupt. Now, am I wrong? But isn't the isn't CNN more the beast power, and with EWTN being the dragon power? Okay. Uh, yeah, I was trying to think it, whether I didn't Jeff put it that way. I believe so. So he put it the way you're saying. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if if that's correct. Okay. Um, because you know the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. So the beast would have to be the Catholic Church. The dragon would have to be the globalists, which would be CNN and the false prophet, you know, Fox. The the ultimate point is these are these are media streams like the false frogs that are spirits like frogs yeah right that are directing people into false paths yeah yeah and this is one of the things that 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 i've noticed is you know because i've been watching now the different forms of media and um they're all mixtures of truth and error and, and none of them are directing us to the truth, to Christ. And yet we can get emotionally caught up in what, what they're saying because they might elicit sympathy with things that we already believe or feel with our nature. And so we need to recognize this. And, and especially when it comes for us, the Protestants, we don't recognize how much our interpretation of prophecy is being affected by the Protestants. We think we're following Miller's rules, but really we're not. So, so it's just something we have to be very cautious about in our personal study. Anyway, I appreciate everyone. I know I went a little bit over time. I like to finish at 8.30, but uh, uh, any final comments before we close with prayer? Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for your goodness and love, for the Sabbath, for the fellowship we can have. And we ask, Lord, that you can lead and guide us, be with us in our study tomorrow morning. Pray that you can help Dwight um, as he um, struggles through some of the things he has to struggle through in, in this study. And I just pray that you can your angels can watch over him and that you can help us as we seek your face. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray.